Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Welcome to Stories Our Soul Food. We're recording this one late at night. This is way past Brian Cole's bedtime, but it's right around my mid morning. Yeah, a little bit of mixed up schedules for yeah, one slide. of us. We won't. We won't slide tell you. Away. Yeah, we won't say who has the broken schedule. We won't. <laughs> we won't give that away. I do think we need an episode about that at some point. Uh, yeah, about <laughs> night owling, the life of the night owl. My wife and I live a lady hawk existence. If you know that old film, I do. Uh, it's a fantastic, hilarious movie but yeah we do a lady hawk thing yeah i'm I'm looking for the bishop to skewer with my giant two-handed sword so we can get on the same clock (laughs) we need to find the mouse who gets to be the mouse yeah well matthew broderick gets to reprise his role okay that's good he probably has nothing else to do after (laughs) (laughs) yeah nothing (laughs) well so we're here to talk about some stuff i've written yeah uh, specifically well i don't know how you describe this one but i have in my hands first edition first printing which you know is 13 years ago First edition, first printing of yeah, I checked the 100 Cupboards. 100 Cupboards, the first book of the 100 Cupboards trilogy. Yep. Although and there's a prequel making it a quartet. Right. But it's not. It's a trilogy with a prequel, yeah. according to publisher. Okay. Not you a know, quartet though. Standards. Okay. No. Yeah. Right. Not a quartet. Yeah. 2007. And I mean, it's gone everywhere since then, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. The, the Cupboards trilogy and my own self and my writing career have been around the block a couple of times since that boxing day of 2007 when that book released. That's fine. December 26th, 2007. Yeah, that's great What a release day, by the way. The day after Christmas. (laughs) Yeah. What a release day. (laughs) So, you cannot buy it for presents until next year. No. You can buy it as a return when you've returned the presents you didn't want. (laughs) Uh, which, well, yeah, I, and I was excited to talk about this one because, well, I read, I read Lee Pike first, your first novel. But How old were you, Brian, when this came out? I was, let's see, I was born in 88, so 98. I was, I was 19. There you go. That's, you were a teenager, verily yeah. a teenager when this book came out. And it was the same year as my first book, Lee Pike Ridge. So, Lee Pike Ridge came out 2007 also, May of 2007, which is, again, oh, okay. weird strange that I had yeah. sort of like, bam, bam, like, okay, here's a novel in May, here's a novel in December. Uh-huh. But you were 19 for both of them or were you 18 for Lee Pike? Oh, sorry. I would have been, I would have been, I would have been 18 for Lee Pike. Yeah. So, 18 for Lee Pike, 19 yeah. for 100 Cupboards. Yeah, I can pace, can pace uh, those, those formative years as I headed off to New St. College. Andrews College. Early days yeah. of college. You got to experience my middle grade fiction. Yeah. For the first time alongside the rest of the world. So, yeah, 2007, December 26th, right. 100 Cupboards released to zero fanfare. Right. Of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> and then, sort of. and it gained, it gained all of its own, right? Yeah, it really, it did build and build and became its own. How many languages is it in now or about? I actually, you know, I don't know. I think it's in the 24 yeah. range. I, mean, so, I know that I've seen lots of covers. I've seen lots of covers. I have many, many boxes of strange foreign editions, <laughs> uh, some of which I adore and some of which I just have to laugh out loud. Yeah. So, there's a French edition where they basically just put a cover of Harry Potter on it <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's pretty epic because it's like, I've never seen this cover of Harry Potter <laughs> before, but this is a cover for Harry Potter. That is not my character. That's a you know, glasses wearing black haired boy who looks like he's off to boarding school. And they just photoshopped out the scar. (laughs) Yeah. For some reason, he's chasing this golden thing with wings. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. It was pretty epic. The Germans did a great job. There's some amazing Eastern European covers. Yeah. Uh, I love the Asian editions, but yeah, it's, it's gone and gone and gone. It's been really kind of funny because it felt like such a fizzle. It felt like lighting a fuse and running, you know? Yeah. And then okay. standing there being like, is it going to go? Is it dead? What is, <laughs> is this what it's like to release a book? Yeah. I've done it. I've done this twice now. This is my debut year. Right. And now that I've watched how it's done correctly, 
it really it really does kind of um like i can look back and look at all the the lines of sunshine i got fed by publicists and marketers and <laughs> and uh shysters in uh in new york city okay. uh, and many people i liked it just you know i i was you were a new author and you got put in new author spots yeah but it was it wasn't because of bad intentions it was kind of funny because it was a big deal it was a big acquisition for random house other publishers were chasing the series uh at the time and we can get into like a little backstory on the on the books soon but other publishers were chasing the series we flew out to new york aaron ranch my agent and i flew out and met with a different you know met with some editors and kind of got their takes and where they wanted to go and what their vision was for the series and really really loved what random house random house children's books then now penguin Ra random house mm -hmm. uh love what they brought to the table loved what they had to say loved their perspective on it editorial vision got along with them very well knew i could work with them well and then could but then discovered you know i was entering an industry that was in it was in uh, distress, shall we say, in 2007. Yeah. Actually, it was 2005 when we made the sale and 2007 when it released. So, you know, it's when it was coming out. I remember meeting with a publicist and Random House flew me out for this big sales conference with all their sales reps from all around the country all came in to upstate New York and well, upstate's a little overstatement north of New York City. And so I was there and I think, you know dan brown and some other big names and it was like okay we're getting we're getting off to the races here this is for real and i so i spoke to like their 400 sales reps or however many i don't know hundreds yeah met with a publicist to talk plans and then she vanished along with all the plans and went and took a job you know working for like ralph loren no nope. i was like <laughs> oh so okay and so what are we doing <laughs> like what's am i am i touring what's all that stuff we talked about is any of that happening you know it was this big thing of like hooray mm. and this meeting the whole company and coming out and speaking at sales conference went really well and then she was super sweet and then she was gone and there was nobody else filling her shoes and that was the, my first taste of well my first taste of what it's like the dog eat dog hunger games world of book publicity mm. uh, especially book publicity right then yeah, so what was wrong with the industry? Because that was Harry, wasn't that Harry Potter time? The end, yeah, of, the yeah, tail was, end of Harry Potter time? Yeah, Harry Potter still was still kicking. But it's, you know, this, this might not be at all what the audience is in, interested in. So I'll move on quickly, but I will say, I will say <laughs> no, uh, yeah. uh, it's a basic business model issue where you have a massive publisher. And so you have imprints that people think of as different publishers, Doubleday, Delacorte, Knopf, mm -hmm. Random House Children's Books. Turns out they're all the same. Right. They're just different floors of the same skyscraper. They then go up frequently up to the same boss. You know, it's like if you're publishing middle grade fiction, sometimes they're independent. It's really weird tangled hierarchies. And sometimes they're, there's somebody over, over all these different children's publishers and editors mm -hmm. that they report to. But then there's a freestanding publicity department that does not answer to any of those publishers oh. at all. There's sort of a lateral, a lateral connectivity, and then the boss of that division ended up being the number two overall of the entire division of Random House Children's Books, which included tons and tons of... So there was the imprint, Random House Children's Books, and there was the division, Random House Children's Books, and under that division, there were all these different imprints and symbols, and you know, I had books released under Blue Fire. It's hmm. like, what's that? It's like, oh, it's a thing we made up. Uh. Yearling. <laughs> Uh, those are yeah. all directly, those are just sub brands to Random House Children's. Right. But anyway, there are these poor nine publicists, I think at the time, uh, varying between six to nine, sometimes above that, who were trying to do publicity. Wait, for all of those imprints? All of those imprints. <laughs> there are six to nine. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's, it's not their fault. It's like, okay, so we don't answer to you, we answer to our bosses who are also your bosses about how well we are doing with particular titles. And I found out very, very quickly, if a book is doing well organically, you know, it can, it can be really, I mean, it just, why would we spend money on this? It's in the black and it's uh, very, very easy to chase books that are failing or had huge advances or are deep in the red. It's easy to chase those. 
I actually had one moment and then we'll move on to the actual story. <laughs> one moment where I'm sitting in my editor's office on Broadway in this really cool skyscraper with an amazing lobby. I have to say the Random House building has an amazing, <laughs> amazing lobby. And if you ever get a chance to read the book at random, it's an amazing book about the founding and building of Random House. Huh. So at random is terrific and they still require any incoming editor to read it. But I was sitting in my editor's office. I think it was the 17th floor, but don't quote me. 17 2. And suddenly the head of publicity came raging in to his office, like furious, raging, <laughs> threw the door open. And I was kind of behind the door and she couldn't see me and was yelling at my editor about the fact that the Today Show had picked 100 cupboards. Oh, your book. And she was not happy, Bob, <laughs> as they say in. Uh, Incredibles. The, yes, as they say in the, in the Incredibles, not happy, Bob. She was upset. But why? Isn't that a great thing for you today? To yeah, no, that's the, but that's a great thing for me oh. as the author of that book. If you are the head of publicity for that many publishers and you, and you have a close relationship with the producer of that show and you wine and dine the producer of that show. And you might, best case, get three to four titles per year on that show. Oh. And then they up and pick one themselves without, without you. Okay. So, the people you'd promised all of a sudden, or sorry, the publicity. Yeah. The one yeah. she'd promised is no longer getting on the show. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'd, been, I'd had conversations with a great publicist there. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to remember which book this was. I'm not, it doesn't matter. But I'm, I'm on the phone with the publicist and the publicist is telling me, which balls got dropped. No, we never pitched that. We never pitched that show. We didn't go out. All those pitches got killed because the, the boss lady of the publicity division has to have discretion, have power over which books get those mm. big pieces of publicity, those giant pieces of publicity collateral. Yeah. And so, this publicist was explaining to me on the phone how none of that actually happened and then suddenly stopped and started telling me like, no, actually we, we did do all those things. We're doing a great job. You don't need to do anything. We're on it. Don't worry. And I get it. My phone dings and I'm getting a text from my post at the same time that says, call me at home and I'll tell you what's actually happening. Oh, no way. That's and so then I <laughs> call the bubbles just at home and get it. So I, I had this weird whiplash and I'm told on, in that private phone call on the private line uh, that the truth had been being spoken to me and the boss had walked by. And, and all of a sudden, we needed the, the company been, line. Yep. So, anyway, okay. 100 cupboards for me is part of, I, I can look back on that and it's weird because I relate to that book differently than any other book because I was still fresh-faced and naive. I, I was so naive about the industry and it, yeah. then suddenly my publicist quits and the plans go away and then I get the news from the publisher who's like, hey, we've moved it to December 26th. What? <laughs> no, no, really. That's a great week. It's a huge entertainment week. No, now, they told it you It is that. actually. Here's the funny part. It's, it used to be back when there was such a thing as a theater. It was enormous in the box office. The week after Christmas is historically the biggest box office week of the year. Okay. So, that was the data they were pointing to. But I was saying, so what about book sales? <laughs> you know, I, that data was not as forthcoming. Anyway, it came out. All it really did is... By releasing it when they released it, all they did is take it off the table for any possibility of any awards because- Yeah, it's the end of the it's year. Right, you're, you're technically in that year, but none of the committees are aware of it or have read it. <laughs> so, it got moved up across the calendar line and suddenly just vanished you know, from contention of anything. Uh, where Lee Pike Ridge, which had released in May, had been shortlisted you know, in, in, dis in awards discussions everywhere, cupboards came out and was just like- pfft, there it went. And yet, God had his own plan and the story started to build and grow and stack and yeah. multiply. And then suddenly Random House is calling it a bestseller and I'm saying, wait, what? And then it's in this territory and that territory and other territories and it's selling in territories for more money than I sold it to Random House for. And it's mm -hmm. selling into sub territories. And that was really odd. Yeah. And it built and built and grew. And and, you know, it's one of those things that then it led me to a position that I have explained to many, many aspiring authors and other creative professionals is that cream rises. There's a realizing there's so much I can't control, right? Like there's so many things I can't control. I can't control whether my publicist quits. I can't control anything. I can't control whether there's, there's an earthquake in Haiti when my book is releasing. 
I can only control how good the book is. I can only work and work and work on that story so that when a kid sits and reads that book, they close it filled. Yeah. If they if they close it affected, filled, inspired, yeah. That's what I can work on. That's what I can right. focus on. And I think that's what cupboards and here's where we in move. the end did. We move from the inside baseball. Yeah, you know, we're, no more talking about the publishing industry. Right, but moving in there, you mentioned the term middle grade a bunch right. of times. Can you explain? I've heard some people who thought middle grade meant just B quality, but it has nothing to do with <laughs> Middle grade. <laughs> nothing to do with- It's a B minus book. Yeah. We have this sub market we call B minus. <laughs> yeah. Middle grade is middle grade. I mean, the middle yeah. grade, middle grades, literally the middle grades, books that target the middle grades. Yeah. Usually eight to 12. Yeah. So Harry Potter is technically middle grade. Consumers tend to say young adult and middle grade interchangeably, and that's not the case in the industry. So uh, plenty of people who've been involved, homeschoolers even, who've been involved in finding curriculum or, you know, wading through uh, stacks and stacks of books or listings for their child readers will probably have been burned before by the acquisition of a young adult novel. Yeah. Young adult is where we introduce all the edge. Right. Changes so, from relationship. No, so from friendship to relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just like they're, they're always fighting over movie ratings of what can go in a PG film, what can go in a PG-13 film, and that's ebbed and flowed. And currently, uh, you know, PG-13 can include bots and a couple F-bombs. We can have nudity and F-bombs in PG-13, uh, but not smoking. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> stuff, oh, stuff like that you know they, there's th there's things like that so but yeah, middle middle yeah. grades like that where it's it's pg yeah and it can be it can be pg-13 uh for suspense for action but it cannot be pg-13 for adult themes when you get into young adult you suddenly have adult themes uh, a friend of mine Jeannie birdsall who wrote the penderwick penderwicks series and won the national book award for that, which is fantastic. Uh, said middle grade is the best because you have all the intelligence and none of the hormones. Mm. As soon as you move into young adult, it's all about relationships, love triangles. A yeah. lot of the marketing is over which boy do you love more? And you, so you have, you know, team this boy or team that boy or, Ugh. you know, and you, you kind of drive the crushes and the romances. Middle grade, it's still innocent. Relationally, it's still stranger things more than it is twilight, you know. Yeah. Young adult splits the difference. So, Stranger Things had plenty of language and themes and stuff, but those kids and the way those kids functioned is more middle grade than YA. The intensity of the duress would push that up. Right. So, anyway, it's middle grade books are things like Charlotte's Web, and yeah. which glorious book. Yeah. And Beverly the, Cleary. Yeah. The early Harry Potters. And so, it can yeah. skew to young middle grade, eight, the kind of book an eight-year-old would read is very different than the kind of book a 12 year old could read right so i've always played to the top end of middle grade so where athleticism action you know that's all possible yeah. and it's believable the suspension of disbelief can encompass that yeah that we can believe these kids can do these things physically and you don't have to worry about you know whether or not we're gonna grapple with so-and-so's budding sexuality which yeah. is sort of which is what's happening it's over and demanded. over. It's demanded. In yeah, you read, you read all the books that are coming out in the middle grade imprints now and it's kind of a joke that <laughs> you'd be saying, wait, we're talking to eight to 12 year old and this is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all abuse and all romance. Yep. And, and they're that, trying and that's, that's part of the, that's part of the push, like the ratings push. We're trying to push those themes down younger and younger and younger. Yeah. So, it's, it offends people yeah. when you say, no, we can't do that for middle grade kids. And they say, their response no. is, are you saying that's not healthy? If it is a healthy and wholesome thing, it's a healthy and wholesome thing for any age. It's not a theme to be introduced later when they're older. It's a theme to be introduced right this second. And so, yeah. there's a constant pressure in the industry to introduce gross stuff earlier and earlier. But Just we still a, haven't really gotten yeah. to the covered story. Right. Should yeah. we do that? Should we? <laughs> I, this at is some so point, fascinating. I, at, I think, some, <laughs> at some I point, I should shamelessly plug these books. I'm happy to talk inside baseball about publishing. I'm no, kinda, we should talk I'm about it past because caring. It's been like a day. It's been 13 years since this book yeah. came out. So I can kind of talk about the, the pooched, the, the pooched launch or. Right. Cause for, uh, from the consumer side, reading this book was so fun 
as a, the you know the fresh faced Brian that I was, <laughs> the <laughs> young nineteen year old Brian Cole. <laughs> it, it was it was great. So the overall, <laughs> let me just give you the background here for the series of one hundred cupboards. First, a buddy of mine named Mark Beecham, who is uh, a classic cat and whom I've always enjoyed greatly since we first met as freshmen in college, was over at my house and one of us, somebody said 100 little cupboards in conversation. I don't know why. I don't, even, I don't remember the context. Probably some cabinetry he was getting from the surplus sale that he was going to put on the roof of a grain silo because that's the kind of thing he was always doing. <laughs> Card catalog. Yeah. Yeah. So, somebody said that and I said, man, that sounds like a good title for a book. 100 little cupboards. And that was it. Just passing thought. Then my wife leaned in from the kitchen and said, that sounds like a stupid book. <laughs> and Good for Heather, yeah, the catalyst. And said, uh, 100 places to put your plates. And what would that be about? So, to win the argument, I dove in and said, nope. And on the fly said, there's this kid and he's in boarding school in New England and he's stuck there and he's really timid and overprotected, but he's overprotected by parents who are trying to make up for the fact that they're always absent which is incidentally uh, usually the case with overprotective parents. Not always, but huh. when parents are really absent, they're either totally absent or they try to replace themselves with proxies, rules, nutritional guidelines, whatever. So, he has absent parents who are travel writers. He never sees them, but you know they require him to be in a car seat and wear a helmet and PE and do all sorts of really horrible things. So, he's this overprotected, fragile, weak, timid boarding school boy. And I'm still pitching this story and saying, and then his parents are abducted and he, you know, they disappear and nobody knows where they are. And so, he gets shipped off to Kansas to live with his aunt and uncle in this old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere uh -huh. until his parents are found and he gets stuck in the attic and one night there's a banging on the inside of the attic wall and plaster falls off and wakes him up and he starts chipping off the plaster and he discovers 99 little doors, cupboards, right? none of which match, all different, different sizes a post office box with light coming through it and all this weird stuff. So, my wife taps out. She's like, okay, fine. It'd be a fun story. It'd be fun. And I thought, great, done. I won the argument. <laughs> and then the next, the next morning, I woke up and she was staring at me while I woke up. I was like, had one of those moments where somebody's staring at you as you wake and asked her what was going on. And she said, what happens next? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> And she said, in the story, what happens next? I was like, what story? And she said, in the cupboard story, what happens next? He was just there. Nice. And called, I said, called the bluff. Yeah. And I said, I don't know. I, I just made that up to win an argument. I've never, I don't know. And she said, well, you have to write it. And so, that day I started. So, okay. that was like, she was insistent. And so, that day, that night, I started typing the first words. And Henry York came to life. Yep. And that was the beginning of the trilogy. And I, I tried to write the whole thing as one big giant single volume and it ended up being enormous and bloated and a hot mess. And then Random House, uh, they were the ones who's, who said they really wanted it in a trilogy. And others were interested in different splits, quartets, duets, uh, solo volumes, yeah. which would have been difficult, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, we went with Random House, broke it into three and we're off to the races. The thing about it, once I actually was sitting down, I knew I was going to write it. I couldn't just write it because it was a fun idea or because my wife wanted me to. I ne it needed to have a purpose. I needed to have a North Star. I needed to have a beating heart, really. What made 100 Cupboards, 100 Cupboards. And one of the things I realized about my own life is that I had an amazing childhood and I could go from your dad's classroom, finish school and head over to my buddy's house which was a farmhouse, a tall, creaky farmhouse on the edge of town with a huge, big red barn mm. uh, beside it, which is the big red barn in 100 cupboards. And go over there and it's a huge, big red barn and there's a stream across the yeah. street and an old rock quarry. And my buddy and I could go climb all around the barn, dig up treasure under the floorboards, climb up into the pigeon roost or try to explore the quarries, run through the wheat fields with BB guns. You know, we could get chased by this yellow biplane crop duster through the wheat fields after school. Yeah. You know, and plink away at it with Red Rider guns. Yeah. And have him, you know, barnstorm us, circle around us and just chase us like a Hitchcock. <laughs> so, straight out of North by Northwest, I could be that kid in America by a big red barn with a Red Rider BB gun 
running through a wheat field <laughs> with a yellow biplane chasing me while we laughed ourselves sick. And oh, then we man. went and then we went and caught fish in the creek. Yeah. Or floated down the stream. That's the Palouse. Yeah. Yeah. And I could have that, which is magical. And I could then read a fantasy novel and love it and just wish I lived somewhere interesting. Yeah. So that fifth grade me could read something about British kids having a magical adventure mm -hmm. and just be really resentful or frustrated about my own existence. And stories have the ability to provoke a complete lack of perspective. <laughs> so a lot, a loss of perspective because there's no talking lion in my life or there's no right. Sauron, there's no ring of power. And at, at around the age that I was running through those wheat fields, getting chased by the plane, or floating the streams. Those were, that was the same age that I was loving Lord of the Rings and starting to get really rigid and refusing to read more broadly yeah. and just kind of missing the magic around me. And so when I set out to write 100 Cupboards, when I got past the argument with my wife and it became something I had to give multiple years of my life to, like I now, I now have to give a stack of years to this story. I needed it to have a purpose. <laughs> it couldn't yeah. just be for fun. It has to have a purpose. And the goal was to try to provoke an awareness and, and a sort of an awakening in the reader to the magic of the world around them yeah. as, as opposed to a yearning for an escape to a different world. So, yeah, we've talked about escapism in the wrong yeah. way. So, you wanted the anti-escapist yeah. story. Yeah, and so I wanted to take, I loved Borges and his weird magical realism. And I wanted to take fantasy like Tolkien, like Lewis, in that it's, uh, you know, built around, you know, the architecture of the gospel and Christianity. I wanted to take that, but I wanted to locate it here. And I wanted this, this world, this one is the one that goes crazy, you know, traditional fairy tale. And I wanted my main character, Henry York, to discover the magic of this world. And it's not until he does that, that the doors to the other worlds begin to open. And so, yeah. he is tripping out, staring at the stars in Kansas. He's tripped out by baseball and barbecue and big red barns before he ever, yeah. you know. Needs a door. Yeah, yeah, before he needs a door. And so, Kansas and America and this world is the first magical world. It's the first Narnia that this kid steps into. So, I wanted... Away from the boarding house. Yeah, away, away, away from, from oppression and rules and... Car seats for seven-year-olds. Institu <laughs> yeah, institutional, like really heavily institutionalized education. And, you know, I wanted him to be, you know, that kid from another world who steps into this one as, as Narnia. And there's moments that Lewis really alludes to that brilliantly. I think Prince Caspian marvels to the Pevensies about how he's always wanted to see a ball world. You know, one of the one of the round ones because no, he, he lives on a flat one. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, we'd sail right off the edge. I've always wanted to see a round one, and they're like, it's not that fun when you're there. <laughs> you know, it's, and I think that's that is there's deep wisdom there because you know it's not that fun when you're there. If you if no one had ever heard of a butterfly and you found butterflies, yeah, it would melt your brain. If you'd never, if no one ever heard of a butterfly and somebody put it in a fantasy novel. Right, it the, fits the whole in, process it, of yeah. eating until you uh, freeze yourself and turn <laughs> into a mass of liquids. Yeah, yeah okay. it, it's, right. you know, this is, they're, they're the kind of creatures that could exist only in Lothlorien, you know? Yeah. These weird worms, even the worms turn into these brightly colored, delicate flying objects and they're everywhere here. <laughs> and from We the, call them cabbage whites and we don't care that much about yeah, <laughs> we just we just don't care. So, we have, whatever we have, we're used to. And we we forget how magical it is and how potent it is. And so with cupboards, the goal was twofold. One was to just insist that magic is here, that the adventures are here. They're in this world. This is the place where you have to wake up. So you have to open your eyes. You have to open your senses. Yeah. It's not a question of oh man, I wish something exciting would happen to me. It's a question of how alert and aware um, and active are you in your own narrative so you, you're if we're going scriptural motif here you really like the idea of adam waking up for the first time in the garden and then na needing to name everything the idea right. that adam wouldn't be excited by every little thing is kind of ridiculous right yeah. and because he's finite he would still shut down and not be excited by every little thing right. which is kind of funny yeah it was just like we get jaded so 
if you were given a uh, the best wine or the best bourbon every single day of your life, right? It would not be very long before it was like, eh, you know, you could be like French people would pay thirty thousand dollars for this. I'm like, well, no, I'm not French, <laughs> <laughs> you know, nor do I have thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's weird how quickly we can acclimate to wonder and just forget it to become numb. So anyway, cupboards was about magic here in this world as opposed to escapism and about waking up here about being a character here and then seeing what doors open to you when yeah. you when you are doing that when you are functionally stu- stewarding the adventure in front of you where you are in your backyard yeah uh in your attic then what opens to you and then other th- and then on top of that was just part of the way americans have fallen for fantasy in the past is the sleight of hand of it being British. So, it's always British. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. a lot of the great stuff is. But it enables us to feel like we're reading uh, something set in a magical world already when we start. Trains. Trains. Tea boarding time. schools. Tea time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's... And even the, the you know, even the, the dialogue, the language, the dialect of the characters and so on. We right. all know that British accents intimidate American audiences, which is why everyone has to have one in any position. and. Right. Any, yeah, yeah. <laughs> villains refer to yourself as one. One, yeah. one thinks. <laughs> one thinks does one not. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to do Magic in America because Potter was big and Narnia before that, and every one of my favorite book series growing up, and even now, every one of my favorite ones was British. They all were British, and so I didn't want to be insecure or apologetic for the fact that I'm American. I didn't want to pretend. I didn't want to put on a smoking jacket and hold a pipe. Oh, yeah. And try to be Lewis. I can't be Lewis. I grew up in the wheat fields of Idaho. I grew up running with a Red Rider BB gun, floating down streams and trying to catch fish and playing with a crop duster. And there is a magic to that. Like that is a magical foreign world for many, many, many people. Right. Which gives me the same advantage that the Brits had. So I wanted to have magic global fantasy start in a rural backyard. With the smell of tar weed. Yep. Yeah. In a rural backyard where they play baseball and have barbecues and that's a big red barn. Yeah. And the characters discover the magic of that place and then the fantasy takes them off, you know, to every corner of this globe and its history and other worlds. So, anyway, those were, that was like the agenda. As I sat down to write and to map the whole plan... It was, okay, I'm going to write something that is anti-escapism, that is escapist, but anti-escapist. How do I write fantasy that motivates child readers to stare at their backyard? And be excited. To get on their belly and watch a roly-poly and just watch. How do I get them to start feeling their walls and measuring their rooms? How do I get them to really explore their space, both in you know, the microcosm and the macro? And then also, how do I prove, how do I convince people and prove that magic is in the very fabric of reality that God's woven into all of this? It's not just British. Yeah. And I actually, on an early book tour, when I did actually go on a book tour, I was in a a huge auditorium in Salt Lake City, I think it was, talking to the students from nine schools all at once. And I asked them, if you want to have a magical adventure, where do you have to live? And they shouted collectively, England. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and that's like that's my motivator where yeah no like anywhere the answer is anywhere wherever you are in god's universe something crazy is happening under your feet for sure yeah um above your head in your own body yeah like how you function how you're alive mm. and i have a big long spiel about it that's really notes from the tilt world it gets into the nonfiction. yeah but the worldview that i outline in my nonfiction is the worldview that i you know, lay as bedrock underneath all the middle grade fiction that I've read. Well, it's your whole theme for yeah. soul food. That yeah. That's how you got to train your imagination or you Yeah. Are so, the, the goal is to train your imagination and open your eyes so that you can be fully engaged in the real world, yeah. not resent it. Because you're not trying to go to Narnia. No. We're trying to make this place better than Narnia. We're trying to make this place the garden. Yeah. Um, new heavens, new earth. That's the destination. This place is amazing. This place still kicks the tail of any magical world any author has ever made up. And I will get into arguments with kids in virtually every school visit about that. Yeah. Because one of the, okay. the super easy questions for the visiting author is always, they, they 
are required for some lit class to come up with questions. Oh, yeah. And so there's lots of uh, how many books have you written? <laughs> and <laughs> how long does it take? How much money do you make? Is, is <laughs> a nice common one with middle grade kids. If you could live in any magical world from fiction, which would it be? And my answer to that one is always this world. Like for sure, a hundred percent, I'd rather be here than Middle Earth or here than Narnia. There's not, not yeah. even a question. You know, it's, it's fun to wander and let your imagination go off and be fed in those places. But this place is so much more convincing. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. it's yeah. compelling and convincing. Well, I mean, it doesn't have ragants though, which I do feel like. It's got this, yeah, I like the ragant. <laughs> you know, my, the ragant, for those of you who have not read 100 Cupboards, is a pretty amazing beastie. Yeah. Uh, well, he's up, the one knocking. Yeah, he's yeah, he's knocking on the wall and he shows up at the end of the book and then is a, you know, a star through the series in different ways. But um, we have things better than dragons. There's no question. I mean, dragons yeah. are awesome, but all I did is take goose wings and stick them on a little basset hound sized rhino. So, <laughs> I didn't make up basset hounds. I didn't make up rhinos and I definitely didn't make up goose wings. I'm just the one who got out my scissors and glue and yeah, you know, and stole stole those things. So, anyway, cupboards has really resonated and it's really grabbed people. And it's I think in part because I really want to write compelling realism in fantasy. Mm. I don't want to write the idea for a scene, you know, like where I write to the intellect. I really do try to convincingly write to the senses of the readers. And so when you write with villains or you write with, you know, with evil or with action anything that's got a little suspense to it. Uh, it's a lot more stressful when you, when you write to people physically, when you write to their yeah. senses. So, you know, it's, I had plenty of conversations with people. They're saying like, why do you have to be scarier than Harry Potter? And I think, what? I'm nowhere near. I don't have, I don't have uh, whatever they're called, the Dementor sucking your soul out of your face. Right. Or um, the Voldemort. The zombies, the infernal. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I don't have somebody ritualistically cutting off their own hand to bring about the resurrection of Voldemort. Right. Um, or I don't stealing have, people's I, minds. Yeah, you know, I like, don't, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't do anything like that. But the scenes I do write, you will feel. Yeah, uh, that's my goal. And so, well, I always, I always enjoy recommending this book to people who are saying, "Oh, my son doesn't know what to read." And, and right, and it's, I do it's, too. <laughs> it's, it's a great one. By to be, mine, yeah. I say. I, I always say you you won't go wrong with this. And there's three of them plus a prequel, and then more beyond that. I don't know. It's just a fun sort of avenue, uh, an on ramp onto uh, a taste for fiction they're not going to get from. It is. Many I, mean, other I will things. say. I will say that I'm definitely writing to that fifth grade self to myself, the kid who was tired of reading and the, the kid who had to be sat on the couch and his, have his mom read him a scary chapter from King Solomon's <laughs> Minds to get gripped, to be grabbed by the five senses and pulled by the imagination into a wild scene, which took me into a whole life of reading and writing, you know, that, that moment. So, yeah. I'm, defi I'm definitely crafting stories aimed at that kid, that yeah. kid who could think that he lived in a boring world when he most certainly did not. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, that's great. Uh, uh, I really enjoy, you have lots of, well, I guess it's cousins in Wander Cupboards, but the cousin pairs are awesome. Brother, sister pairs. I, I enjoy the interaction of the family too. You know, there's just right. a lot to, I suppose we can't get into all that right now. We'll be too but long. But I will tell you this, uh, the audio book is a lot of people love it. I can't listen to it. I never did listen to it because the narrator read a little too much uh, in addition to saying the name of the main villain incorrectly, uh, the narrator just read a little bit of too much anger into the banter in the siblings. Oh. The, the banter of the siblings <laughs> in the books is intended to be deeply affectionate. There's always... Oh, as opposed to like actually upset. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, I always had running arguments with my sisters where we were all laughing and we were all trying to win and we're all, it, was, it was just like a thing where we're all in this perpetual struggle <laughs> with each other. <laughs> To be right. <laughs> but um, it was never mad, angry. It was never allowed to be. And so, it bummed me out when I was listening to it and being like, oh, I could see why he would think that was the inflection, but that's just not what I hear. I just don't hear it that way. That was not the intention. So, and it's not been picked up. There's actually been plenty of people who don't pick up on that at all. But I tend to think, please just read it off the page. Okay. You know, read it off the page. Don't listen to it. <laughs> well, Random House will love me saying that. Do not <laughs> listen to it. Don't uh, listen to that audiobook that Random House produced. <laughs> Even though the narrator is great, it just 
that was that was just a little thing for me like, no they still they out. like each other when they're arguing they still like each other you need to get that on record that, on that. the record they're not as fussy as russell horton the voice of tony the tiger made them out to be in the audiobook also it's nemione yes the audiobook says nemion Okay, which, we, do, we can't get into villains yet. If but. I'm a cat, that holds me up by the tail and rubs all the fur the wrong way to say Nimeon. Yeah. Uh, I've heard Nimeoni, uh, Nimeon. It's like the one for me, the best thing about Harry Potter was I could just say, no, it's like Hermione. It just rhymes with Hermione. Right. Hermione, not based on it. It's the name of the witch who ele- in mythology allegedly put Merlin to sleep. Oh, she's uh, a bad one. Under the wood way back in the day. So yeah, Nimeoni. Yeah. Real name. I didn't make it up. I did choose the pronunciation, which could be historically inaccurate, but it's correct in my story. Well, Merlin's not around to ask so, <laughs> yet. Okay. Well, I, yeah. I think I think we did it. I, I we got talked some... and talked. We got a lot of inside baseball about publishing in there. No, I think everyone- We should probably just save that for its own episode so people who are interested can listen to it. Other people can be like, Skippy. I don't know. I think people who've read it and people who won't will enjoy what it's like- A to little be, backstory. To be the glamorous author. So glamorous. Uh, yeah. So glamorous. Someday, if you want to be an author, you too might be chained to a table at a cocktail party in New York. And Your have publicist to say, may run off to a fashion designer. Yes. <laughs> and you might have to stand there and say hello to 5,700 librarians or <laughs> bookstore owners while you're not allowed to leave your table. And they all get to have fun and, you know, yeah. be at the party and you have to stand no, you're there. You're on display though. Yeah. You're going to yeah. behave. You're going to stand there like a, you know, right. a crock pot of cocktail weenies. <laughs> like, like someone who would like another advance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you please buy another book for me? And this time, could you promote it? <laughs> right. Well, I got, I got some requests to have specific book recommendations okay. on our podcast. And so, this is, the, we're, we're doing our best that if you haven't read Hunter Cupboards, okay. you got to do this. And if well, you have, to, I, have done Hunter Cupboards, yeah. you got to do the prequel. I right? can say, I, let me put it this way. If I'm going to make specific requests, obviously the thing I, the things I prefer the most, the things I love the most that I put the most blood into are on my own books. Yeah. And if you have not read them, then how would you know to trust me or not? Right. So. Well, I view it as you having to put your money where your mouth is. Like yeah. we are talking all big about how important it is <laughs> to read books and do your own books, do what you're trying to do. Right. And they better. So, uh, you know, hit us on Twitter if you think they don't. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we'll definitely answer. I do. I think that basically if you've read the books, if you've read my books, then you know uh, to trust me. Or if you've read them and didn't care for them, then you can find another podcast because why would you listen to me? Right. If you don't like what I've done, you know, it's like, why, why would you trust my sensibilities? There are a number of people whose best-selling books are books about how to get a book published or, you know, aspiring screenwriters who yeah. optioned many scripts and their best book, you know, their best work is a book about screenplay structure, but they never had a hit. They never had a movie really made. Same thing's true where you'll, you'll pick up a book about writing and see in the back, like the author of 50 novels, none of which you've ever heard of. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, that's, um, why would you listen to him? Right. About so, craft, a craft, especially the, if you can't, if yeah. you can't do it, teach, I think it sometimes yeah. unfortunately falls. So, we'll talk as we start working our way through specific books, we'll cover not every one of my books, but uh, at least in broad strokes, the the se- different series. Well, I think and it's then also- we can move on to, you know. I get regular objections where someone says stuff about your books, like, hey, why is that scary? And I think you have interesting, or why is your villain the way that your villain is? Or or why- You why? mean villainous? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think those answers are indicative. And the fact that they're, I think it's because they're getting some real meat out of your book and they're having to chew on it. That's well, how we can I talk I about the uh, We can talk about the scare. And I wrote an article for- the Atlantic Monthly about why I write scary books for kids, which went and went. It kind of went all over the place because it is a big, you know, bone of contention. Yeah. I don't do it for glee. I don't do it gratuitously, but I do have my reasons. Then I try to walk a fine line of, you know, doing it right, doing it in a way that will edify and inspire, you know, that will feed. But that's its whole different thing. We can talk about that next episode. We'll talk about darkness and villains and evil. I like it. And cut. Yeah. Peace out. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. If you want to jump into Indy Wilson's adventure in a hundred cupboards with Henry, Henrietta, and Henry Kansas, you can get those books signed when you buy them from canonpress.com. <laughs>